I saw that it was counted a kind of curse in those days to be born a girl. And I used to wish deeply that I had been born a boy. It was a joy later to find that such inequality and injustice and limitations were the results of circumstances which could and would be changed. One of my missions in life, equal rights for men and women, was finding me. In 2020, more than 2 million people voted in the general election in Ireland. But in comparison, in 1910, that number was just over 200,000, and they were all men. Today, we take it for granted that men and women share equal rights in our society, like employment rights or the right to vote in elections. However, around 100 years ago, things were very different. A woman's place in Ireland was understood to be in the home. Women were not able to vote in elections and weren't seen as equal to men. This inequality impacted both women and men negatively. So what events caused this to change? Welcome to Bonnets, Bandoliers and Ballot Papers. We're at Collins Barracks in Dublin to look at some of the artefacts in the exhibitions here that show how the role of women in Irish society began to change at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Remember, this was a time of great upheaval with World War I raging in Europe and the fight for Irish independence at home. It was against this backdrop that women were also fighting for an equal place in society. So what changes did we see occurring during this period that would alter women's place in Irish society? Who were some of the key women and men involved in creating this change? What was the reaction of many in Irish society towards this change? And how was it achieved through peaceful activism or through more violent protest? We look at artefacts that bring to life the lives and the stories of those who endeavoured to push for a more equal Ireland and to fight for their place in society. We will meet figures from Irish history that you might already be familiar with and also some lesser known ones as we add to the efforts to uncover the stories of women in Ireland, which up until recently may have gone untold. I think this is a hugely important period. Not only is it so vital in the history of the Republic of Ireland and this state being established, but also it's hugely significant because it's so formative for women. It gives women for the first time the opportunity to really fight not just for the independence of their country, but also for their own personal independence in society as well. I think it's very important that young people are aware of the struggle that was involved to obtain the vote, women were not considered equal citizens and they had to make themselves equal. But it wasn't just the vote, it was equality, it was access to education, it was further access to the workforce. It was about, um, I, I suppose, destabilizing that, that binary of public and private, of women being confined to the domestic. It's so important to use your vote and I think people would be more inclined to use the, their power if they knew how much struggle had gone in and what it was like for people when they didn't have their power. Clothes could tell us a lot about someone. People express themselves through what they wear and the way they wear them. Clothes can also tell us a lot about not just a person, but also the norms of the society or the culture they were fashioned in. If we look back through history, it is possible for us to find some clues through clothing about the roles and expectations that may have been placed on women in Ireland. 
Here in the Way We Wore exhibition, we're going to have a look at some examples of clothing worn by women at the end of the 19th century in Ireland and the beginning of this transformative period. You must act, speak and live and dress in society as a Christian woman. Do you go to God's house in the morning dressed like a Christian woman and to the opera in the evening dressed like a shameless heathen? So Alex, here we are in this wonderful exhibition, The Way We Wore. What do these dresses tell us about uh, the role of women in society and uh, what was expected uh, of them? Yes, well, I think women were expected to dress appropriately. Um, there was a sort of notion around dress and respectability in, in the 19th century. The notion that sort of to dress appropriately was to respect yourself and others. And Maria Sweeney wore this dress. We know she had it made by a local dressmaker in her hometown of Ballymote in County Sligo and that she had it made for her brother's wedding. Uh, and that the Sunday following the wedding, she wore it to mass and was criticised by the parish priest for drawing attention to herself in the manner of her dress. Um, so I think the priest would have been very much reflecting kind of more wider ideas around dress and respectability in the 19th century. Um, but the priest, but because the church had so much power in Ireland in the 19th century, I think it would have been probably quite harsh for Maria to have heard that from the parish priest. I can imagine. And, and, and why would he have found this dress so offensive? Well, the family story that came when the dress was given to the museum was that he, he thought it showed her figure too much. Um, and that, probably, that possibly is the case. But I also think the very bright shade of blue might have had quite a lot to do with it. Um, this dress was made at a time when there was an explosion in the development of synthetic dyes. Uh, and you get a huge amount of very brightly coloured fabrics appearing for the first time. Um, and this is quite a bright shade of blue and certainly that would have drawn attention to Maria. Moving along to uh, this wonderful dress uh, and outfit uh, from Mrs Doyle of uh, Phibsborough. Yes, so, so a lot of the garments that are given to the museum come with a family backstory and this one has a particularly good one in that um, during the course of their marriage they had 10 children and she prided herself on being able to get back into this dress after the birth of each child. What I find very interesting is that you, you get these social histories that come with the garments that are given to the museum and that makes them far more interesting because there's a story attached. She would have worn this dress in the afternoon when visiting friends and there was all sorts of rules about social visiting and netiquette around it. She would have left a calling card in with her friends to say she was uh, coming to visit or she would have advertised herself as being at home and available to receive visitors. Um, there was quite strict rules about visiting. You didn't just rock up at the doorstep um, to say hello, as we would do now. <laughs> as you do today. Obviously, when you intersect that with issues of class, different women lived different types of lives. Middle-class women might be more educated. Um, they would perhaps get more involved in philanthropy and charitable good works but they were more restricted when it came to working outside the home. Whereas working class women, while their lives would be blighted with issues of poverty and bad housing, were working outside the home. Um, and so middle class women, while they might have a more comfortable life, it was a comfortable cage in many ways. The true mother has no thought of self. All her life, all her love are given to her husband and children. My name is Orla Fitzpatrick and I work in the National Museum of Ireland. I'm the librarian here, but I also teach history of photography and dress history. Well, I think one of the exciting things about history is getting to know a person and their character and the detective work and looking for those little details is really fascinating. So you'd be surprised what one piece of clothing can tell you about a person and about a period of time. We often use photographs, newspapers, death notices, also stories from the families. And with a little bit of research, you're able to make a pretty full picture and get a full idea of what somebody's life was like. So this outfit dates from the 1880s and it was owned by Honora Rickard, who lived in Ballymahan County, Longford. And it's a two-piece satin outfit, which is very fashionable for the time. The style at the time was very detailed and very fussy. We can see here there are a lot of pleats 
and a lot of contrasting fabrics. The family think it may have been her wedding dress. There's a formal portrait of her wearing this in and around the 11th of February, 1885, which is when she got married. Uh, it was made in Castle Ree by the Fitzgibbon family. And this was a big department store in Castle Ree. They had 28 live-in tailors working there at the time. She would have gone in, picked the fabric, looked at a selection of patterns, and then left it to the team in the shop to make this item. But what we're not talking about is a size 10 or a size 12. You don't go in and buy off the rack, off a shelf. The choice was pretty good. Uh, contrary to what we may think of the 19th century, there were fashionable clothes available in Roscommon in 1885. So Honora would have worn this dress with a corset, which would really have prevented her from moving very freely. She wouldn't have been able to do the things we do now, like she wouldn't have been able to go jogging or run for the bus. It would have really impacted upon how she could move. There was a reaction uh, against the corsets and restrictive clothing. And some viewed that that type of clothing uh, was unhealthy for women. She included in this outfit a bonnet made of matching uh, satin, which has pleats that pick up the same sort of pleats that are in the skirt. This would have been worn at the back of her head um, to allow for the curled hairstyles that were very popular at the time. The bonnets and the title represent the control and social strictures that were on uh, placed on women at this time. And uh, we have an example of this in this beautiful morning dress, which belonged to Mrs. Freeman of Waterloo Road, Dublin. And she was widowed in 1885. Can you tell me a little bit more uh, about this beautiful dress, Alex? Yes, absolutely. And again, um, the onus of uh, mourning dress was on women, not on men. She would have been expected to wear mourning clothes for up to two and a half years. Uh, and the dress that we're looking at is, um, it's, it's made of satin and it's got jet beading on it. So it's actually the second stage of mourning. Um, and first stage mourning would have lasted for at least a year. I think it was a year and a day and no form of embellishment was allowed at all. You could have a fashionable dress, but it had to be in a dull black fabric. Um, and then the further stage of mourning was half mourning where other colours could be introduced. So you could wear grey or you could wear a sort of pale lilac mauve colour. For men, they wore a black armband, maybe for a short while, and they would have worn black on the day of the funeral. So definitely the onus was much more on women. Would Mrs. Freeman have had somebody make this dress for her or would she have bought it off uh, the peg? Up, up until this point, really, if you were wealthy enough, it wasn't considered right to wear off the peg clothes. You, you would have had your clothes tailor made. Uh, but in the case of mourning clothes, one never knew when, when one was going to be bereaved. So there, was really, there, there wasn't the time to go to the dressmaker and have, have your clothes made up. Uh, so off the peg clothing was much more acceptable when it came to mourning dress than it was for, for other forms of uh, women's clothing. So not everyone would have been able to afford a beautiful dress like this. What would other uh, women in different classes have uh, worn at this time? Well, the, the other option was to dye existing clothes, to, to, to take an outfit and dye it black. Um, but obviously even that was a burden for, for some women who couldn't afford it. Quite often what happened was some women would have never stopped wearing black. They would have taken to their widow's weeds and remained in it and never come out. I never knew what widow's weeds was and now I know. Thanks very much. So women's lives and the expectations placed on them by many in society were very different then to what we're used to now. All of this raises the question, how did women break free from these restrictions and what drove this change? Well, one interesting development was the formation of the Gaelic League. While primarily to promote Irish language and identity, it gave women a place to explore their own nationality and political ideas. So the Gaelic League had been established in 1893 by a man called Douglas Hyde. And basically the idea of it was to reinvigorate the Irish language and Irish customs and traditions here in Ireland. Particularly for young women, it is one of the only organisations or the few organisations in which men and women can join 
on a fairly equal basis in which men and women can participate in events um, together. And this would have been a totally new experience for me and the women. They wouldn't have got to do something like this before, to be involved in these sort of big societal movements in this way. And an awful lot of young women get politicised through the Gaelic League. So Alex, one way of making a political statement was to choose to wear clothes uh, like this outfit that we see here. And of course, this would have been influenced by uh, the Gaelic League. Um, can you tell me a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so this dress was made by the Dunemer Guild, designed by Kitty McCormick and made for Claire Kennedy. Now, Claire Kennedy's husband, Hugh Kennedy, was the first Chief Justice in the Irish Free State. They were both passionate believers in the potential of the new state and very keen uh, members of the Gaelic League. And we know that Claire Kennedy wore this dress to um, a pan-Celtic congress in Bangor in Wales in, the, in about 1927. The motifs from the Book of Kells um, were very popular in the end, towards the end of the 19th century um, and were used on all sorts of things. So you get them drawn into illuminated manuscripts, you get them used on ceramics and glass and so on, and also then on textiles. I think they're very much part and parcel of the sort of growing nationalism and the Celtic revival at the end of the 19th century. And would most people have access to this sort of costume at, at this time? Well, I would say probably not. Um, the Gaelic League intended that, they, that women would wear this type of, of garment all the time, uh, thereby buying Irish and not wearing imported fashion. And again, this belief that if you were dressed in Irish clothes, you were more likely to speak the Irish language. So it was encouraging that really in the long term. In actual fact, these clothes aren't terribly practical and really they were really worn for special occasions. So we can see here that uh, clothing is used to uh, show your allegiance uh, to an ideal. Um, how are uh, modern day clothes uh, used in this way? Well, I think people wear uh, clothes signifying all sorts of different things. Um, if we look recently here in Ireland, we would have had the slogan t-shirts and slogan sweatshirts worn during the repeal referendum. Um, we also actually in the museum collection have some, some headgear that was created for the repeal referendum as well. Um, and then when you look at something like, um, you know, GAA shirts, people identify with their, um, with their local team by wearing their county colours. Throughout the first section of our tour, we have seen how clothing for women, in a sense, could be seen as a metaphor for how narrow and limited women's lives were in Ireland at the time. It's hard now to imagine living under these restrictions, but it's easy to understand the desire and the need for change. part of our tour, Bandoliers, we'll examine some major events that led to great changes in Irish society that impacted on women. In this, we'll see how women played a critical, but until recently almost forgotten role in creating this change through both political and violent means. When the First World War uh, begins in 1914, we see the British Army going over to fight in places like France and Belgium, and of course included in the British Army are soldiers here in Ireland. In total in the First World War we see about 200,000 Irishmen going to fight over the course of the years from 1914 to 1918. But the knock-on effect that this has, of course, is that we now have huge spaces in the workforce that need to be filled. Amidst the laughter and the singing, I often wonder why I am with others engaged in such an occupation. To see the rows of shells, so innocent looking, yet made for a specific and terrible purpose, that of human destruction, makes one deeply conscious of their work. It is difficult to think of women in the 20th century engaged in such an occupation. So with all these men going off to Europe to fight, what opportunities arose for women? How were their daily lives affected? 
We're going to look now at the Recovered Voices exhibition with curator Brenda Malone to find out more. Brenda, here we are at the First World War uh, section. Can you tell me about this uh, wonderful photo album that we have uh, here? This photo album is one of the most intriguing um, insights into women working during the First, First World War that I've ever seen. This album belonged to Rosamond, or Poppy, and her sister Eleanor Burroughs, and they were serving with the British Military General Hospital, so they had gone off and become nurses. Um, and the uh, album is full of just a real uh, everyday working life of these women. So it was a real indication of the kind of intense work that women were really engaging with in nursing on the front. So back home in Ireland, women were also getting involved in nursing, but in a different way. So we can see here ephemera from things like St. John's Ambulance and the British Red Cross. Women went and trained with them for about three month courses and became members of the Voluntary Aid Detachment, which was the VADs. So Brenda, this is an On War Service badge uh, that we have here in the Handling Collection. Um, and Florence Lee would have been given one of these. Um, can you tell me a bit more about uh, Florence Lee? Florence Lee was a munitions worker in Dublin and coming from being a seamstress where she would have earned a very, very poor wage. Um, and her wage actually went up to about 50 shillings a week, which may have been about 10 times what she was earning previously. So this was a huge increase for a woman like Florence Lee. And if you can imagine the kind of independence that that woman who was now receiving that kind of money, earning that kind of money, uh, w would now feel about her life. How do women's roles change then uh, when the war ends? Well, despite the fact that women have unionised in the factories, uh, their, their service is abruptly not needed anymore. And the National Shell Factories shut down in 1919. So all of these women now find themselves either back in the home, jobless, or back into traditional roles with very low wages again. And of course, men are coming back from the war as well, and they're taking those jobs that women were actually working in yes. at that time. So as despite well. women having proven themselves, yeah. um, the fact that men are back now and available means that women have to be put back into their traditional sections of society. Thank you, Brenda. You could not go through the things we went through, see the things we saw and remain the same. You went into it young and light-hearted. You came out older than any span of years could make you. But at the time, you did not reflect on it much or anything else. You did not dare to. So women had been thrown into this new position in society. They had got a glimpse of what was possible and a taste for independence. At home in Ireland, this was also a time of growing nationalism and calls for Irish freedom from British rule. And the opportunity to fight for citizenship of a new independent state was also an opportunity to fight for the equality of its citizens. We had the same right to risk our lives as the men. That in the constitution of the Irish Republic, women were on an equality with men. For the first time in history, indeed, a constitution had been written that incorporated the principle of equal suffrage. So we've just talked about the roles of women in the First World War, uh, but there was a growing militarism in Ireland happening at the same period. And here we have a common Amon uniform. Can you tell me a bit more about that time period and uh, women's roles at that time as well? Yeah, this was an extremely interesting period in Irish history uh, where we're seeing ideologies being split and groups forming around those ideologies and arming themselves in preparation for uh, military action when the time comes. So at, at around this time, late 1913, is when we see the Irish Volunteers form. Quickly afterwards in 1914, Common Amon is formed because women are not allowed to be members of the Irish Volunteers. So I mean, this, I mean, it's so beautifully tailored. This belonged to Helena Hoyne, a uh, member of Common Amon. And you can actually see 
that um, it's made of Irish material because that was one of their main aims was to promote Irish industry. But you can see, you know, see the, the box pleats there on the pockets and everything. That's very like the official pattern of the Irish volunteer uniform. So, you know, in, certainly in their eyes, they're very closely linked to the Irish volunteers. So, Brenda, it was notable that um, Common and One were a, uh, an all-women's organisation, but the Irish Citizen Army also allowed women to uh, join. Well, the Irish Citizen Army really came from a different place than the Irish Volunteers and even Common Amon, who were much more focused on the idea of an independent Ireland and nationalism. The Irish Citizen Army were focused on rights and equal rights and citizen rights. So it's natural then to assume that they would have included uh, women in, in their idea of equal rights at that time as well. So. I have a little replica Common Amon uh, badge. Um, and I love it, it's like it's beautifully designed and the type um, or the lettering is wrapped around a, a rifle so you can really, in just that little piece, see how much women were prepared to fight for this independence. Yes, it's, and it's, it's really very ironic because it's women who were, really could not, uh, come and among, could not actually fight with weapons. When it came to the 1916 Rising, they very much were in the role of support. Uh, now, incredibly important support, but it was still transporting messages, maybe transporting arms, but it was very unusual to have women actually be armed during this time. Weapons were very, very scarce during the 1916 Rising, which was one of its biggest problems. So the idea of giving a weapon to a woman who had had no training as part of the Irish Volunteers just just wasn't really going to happen. But of course, Markovic had money and she managed to buy her own weapon. So she actually had two. We have her two weapons are here in the museum that were surrendered at St. Stephen's Green. Okay. And of course, we know that Markovic uh, then went on to fight uh, a, a different type of war. It was the, the election yes. in 1918. And uh, we're going to be talking about that uh, further along as well. So one of the most important and famous individuals from this period is probably Countess Markovic, uh, who had been born Constance Gore Boot. So when you look at many of the key social and political movements happening at this time in Ireland, uh, she was often heavily involved with them. We see, for example, she would have been acting in plays, which would involve the Gaelic League, say in the Abbey Theatre, for example. She would have been in, uh, she would have joined uh, Sinn Féin after it had been established in 1907 by Arthur Griffith. She set up a group called Fina Heron, that was like a boys, uh, like a boys, kind of like a scout group. And then she was, of course, involved with uh, the Irish Citizens Army, which is who she would have uh, fought with in the 1916 Rising. When you honour in song and story the fighters who shouldered a gun and reck not those death stings should reach them if so Ireland's freedom was won. Forget not the women of Erin who stood without terror or dread beside those who battled for freedom mid shall fire and deluge of lead. So in a short time, women had shown that they were willing to take up arms and fight against the British, not just for their country's freedom, but perhaps for their own too. Although the rebellion hadn't received widespread support amongst the Irish public when it happened, the aftermath, which included the execution of 15 men, led to a change in attitudes by many. This soon led to the outbreak of the War of Independence in 1919. Once again, women would be called upon to play a number of crucial roles in the fight for independence. When almost everyone deserted us, those girls stood by us. And at the height of the terror, we found that the more dangerous the work, the more willing they were to do it. So Brenda, here we are at the War of Independence and uh, we're going to be looking the, at the roles of women in the shadows, as it were. And uh, here we have a well-dressed lady and she would have carried uh, 
this book with the gun in it. What's the story behind it? Yeah, so this um, this dictionary was actually left wrapped, waiting to be picked up at the Gresham Hotel. And the name on the label is Miss K Mullen. So we can assume that it was to be picked up by Miss K Mullen and transported by her to somewhere where somebody was waiting for this little automatic pistol that's in it. Now, this may seem like that's a very small gun, maybe not a dangerous activity, but actually this was one of the most dangerous activities that was undertaken during the War of Independence, and it was almost exclusively uh, taken by, uh, undertaken by women. Um, so women were actually responsible for importing uh, an incredible amount of weapons, but also explosives and ammunition. So we have a lot of records and details of women traveling from Glasgow to Dublin on the, on the boats with sticks of gelignite stitched into their coats and skirts, and transporting guns um, in prams and in, in shopping baskets around the city. It's an extremely dangerous activity because if a woman had been found with these guns or ammunition, she would have had seriously uh, very severe punishment, either beatings or imprisonment if she's lucky. But not only are they moving objects around, they're also moving information. And that's one of the key roles that they're playing in the War of Independence. For example, there's, um, there's a woman called Lily Mernon, who's working as a typist at Dublin Castle. And she goes off at every lunchtime and she writes down everything that she's picked up during uh, the day. And she passes that on to the IRA leadership and intelligence unit. So there were many women who were really key in moving really important information around the place that saved a lot of lives and made sure that a lot of men actually escaped buildings before they were raided by the RIC. And this really highlights the difference in the roles of women from 1916 to this very different uh, set of tactics in this guerrilla warfare. Yes, I would say that women are much more integral to the role of intelligence mm. and the movement of information uh, than they ever were before. And they continue then to do so right up into the years of the Civil War, the Treaty of the Civil War. On the 11th of July 1921, the Anglo-Irish Truce was signed and the War of Independence came to an end. That December, the Anglo-Irish Treaty created the Irish Free State, which we now know as the Republic of Ireland, and also copper fastened the state of Northern Ireland. Women had fought for both Irish and their own personal freedoms. However, the key question now was, where would women fit into the new state's plans for Irish society? For so many women, there was an expectation that they would have an equal stance to men in the new state. After all, the proclamation in 1916 had been addressed to both Irish men and Irish women. The Irish suffrage movement had over this time remained focused on winning the right to vote for women. In the next part of our tour, Ballot Papers, we are going to talk to curator Sandra Heise about some of the people and events that led to the first vote for women in Ireland. I think what we've learned or we could learn from the suffragists and suffragettes um, of the, around the turn of the century is that you need to be very resilient to change anything, change the status quo. They had terrible odds stacked up against them, but the knowledge that nothing would improve for themselves, but more importantly for the rest of society, they saw this as infusing society with their vision of, of what, what is right for people, what is right for children, for women, to protect basically the, the bodies of women and children from abuse, for instance. This is why they wanted to do it. It wasn't just about themselves. It was about improving society as a whole. And I think that that is a lesson that we can learn today. We don't like smashing glass any more than men like smashing skulls. Yet in both cases there is, I believe, a strong feeling that something must be broken before a wrong is changed into a right. The suffrage movement first begins in Ireland around in the 19th century with campaigners like Isabella Todd and Anna Haslam. And it's a, a campaign that starts with these middle-class women who uh, are suffragists 
and the importance of uh, suffragists rather than suffragettes. Suffragists are people who campaign uh, and are pacifists. Suffragettes are the people who do militant activities such as smashing windows. The real movement within the suffrage movement starts with the second wave of suffrage activity, which happens in the early 20th century, particularly with the formation of the Irish Women's Franchise League. So Sandra, here we are in front of an array of objects from the museum's collections. Um, and uh, we're standing in front of this uh, very interesting textile uh, banner. And um, it's beautiful um, stitchery, embroidery mm. on a green background. It was made in 1908 and it was made um, on the order of the Irish Women's Franchise League, naturally. Um, which was a, a new organisation. It was the first one set up in Ireland to, for women's suffrage since the 1870s. And they were very different from the organisations that went before. They wanted to try new methods to hurry along the vote for women. So whereas earlier ladies were considered quite genteel in the organisations and careful about what they did, the new, the new um, suffragists tried militant tactics. So they would break windows in government buildings, for instance, but they wouldn't hurt people. So this was part of a new, a new movement, and it's very interesting in terms of today's campaigns as well, because the methods that these women and men were using back in 1908 are quite similar to some of the methods used today. I um, am particularly interested in these uh, particularly Irish motifs, such as the shamrock. It's very interesting that they're using these motifs in, in the design of the banner, mm. isn't it? Yeah, there's, there, it, it's really um, a statement uh, of that this organisation is Irish. Um, it was taken on uh, sort of campaigning trips to England and was used in England and it set the women apart and it's mirroring the uh, Irish uh, Celtic revival as well, isn't it? It it's, is, yeah. it certainly is, which is going on just at the same, same time, yeah. So Sandra, there were some really interesting people involved in the founding of the Irish Women's Franchise League, and we have this wonderful photograph of two of its founders. I do. This is Hannah um, and Francis, or Frank, she's Geffington as he was known. They, um, Hannah was the main mover with her friend, Margaret Cousins, in setting up the Irish Women's Franchise League. So only women could be full members, interestingly enough. But there were very enthusiastic um, associate members in the husbands. So there was Frank Sheehy Skeffington and James Cousins. And those two men actually um, published the, or edited the um, newspaper of the Irish Women's Franchise League, the Irish Citizen. So. That when they got married, they each took each other's names. So she was Hannah Sheehy, he was Frank Skeffington, and they combined their names as a symbol of how, um, of the equality of their partnership. And uh, as with uh, a cause that you might have today, mm. uh, you would might probably have worn a little uh, badge mm. uh, to show that you were supporting uh, a cause. Yeah. So you have this wonderful this badge. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful enamel badge from the National Museum's collection. This is especially poignant, this, the story behind this object, because it was worn by Frank Sheehy Skeffington on his jacket when he was killed in 1916. Uh, was the IWFL um, uh, involved in the 1916 uh, rising? They didn't oppose it, but they, they thought that suffrage was the be all and end all. So there was always a debate in Ireland and indeed in England um, between suffrage and a national effort as it was seen. So in Ireland it was 1916, in England it was the war effort. Um, and different people took different stances, but the majority of the uh, Franchise League people stayed fast to the vote. There were tensions between the nationalist women and the suffrage women, although you do see huge crossovers between them and most nationalist women, certainly of the leadership brigade, would have been also in favour of women's rights and campaigning for that. But the, the, the argument was about which comes first or which has got primacy within their campaigning. And for the suffrage women, it was suffrage above, first above all else was their slogan. And for the nationalist women, they didn't really want to campaign to what they regarded a foreign government in order to gain rights from that foreign government. They wanted an Ireland which would give them those rights. 
there are some real debates between the suffrage women and the nationalist women. Uh, the suffrage women regarded common Amman who saw themselves initially as an auxiliary of the Irish volunteers, as um, handmaidens, they called them, or, or um, you know, animated collection boxes. I think it was Hannah Shee Skeffington called the common Amman women because they were fundraising to arm a body of men to fight for Ireland, whereas the suffrage women would have seen that it should have been men and women, and that the common Amman women were placing themselves in that secondary position. And I think it shows a maturity of uh, political engagement that these women can have those debates and divisions and still unite when it comes to things they both want. And that does happen. So Sandra, um, we're looking at this uh, very interesting object. It looks almost like a chair. What is it? It's a lectern. Um, it was used for speakers to stand upon um, and address a crowd, so you had a little bit of a, a raised um, position above crowd. It folded flat, first of all, so you could transport it. And then it was opened out when you had a public meeting. And it is was belonged to the um, Irish Women's Franchise League. It was made by them. And it has Votes for Women written very helpfully across the top there. So every Saturday, the Irish Women's Franchise League would go to the Phoenix Park and address a crowd. And often it was a hostile crowd, to the extent that um, Frank Sheehy Skeffington at one stage addressed the crowd as the ancient order of hooligans, because they were so badly behaved. And they had to have protection. The suffragists had to have protection from uh, the police and from the trade union members. It's very interesting that it, it looks almost homemade. Yeah, I'd say it was. I'd yes. say it probably was or made by a, um, a carpenter who was known to them. Yeah. But, um, I mean, there are finishes on it, such as the brass kind of uh, trimmings. So it wasn't completely homemade. I'd say it was made by a, a tradesperson, a craftsperson. But it was one of a number that the Franchise League had so that they could have them, um, various people standing up on them, but also at different locations. Would Hannah have stood on this? Yes. That's so interesting. Yeah, I think it's pretty guaranteed. Yeah. yeah. Women's suffrage will, I believe, be the ruin of our Western civilization. It will destroy the home, challenging the headship of man laid down by God. It may come in your time. I hope not in mine. An important part of any election campaign is the coverage in the media. Remember, this was a time before YouTube and Instagram, and postcards and cartoons were the social media of the day. So I visited the Print Museum in Dublin to meet Donna Gilligan, to see what was being written about the call for equality at the time. So Donna, here we are in the Print Museum, and in 2018, you curated a wonderful exhibition uh, that celebrated the centenary of uh, Votes for Women in 1918. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Well, the exhibition really focused on the use of print in the Irish suffrage movement and the importance of that, because at that time, print was the main media in use. It's time before radio, television, um, any other form of getting your message out there, so print is incredibly important. And when you're thinking of this time where women have very little voice in public spaces, that print forms this kind of a voice for women in public and it gives them the opportunity to be able to put the message to promote suffrage out there and to gain support from the public. So Donna, can you tell us about some of the material that you have here that was part of that exhibition? So some of the material we have here are some uh, suffrage postcards and these are presenting both the pro-suffrage and the anti-suffrage sides. And we can see in some of these postcards the huge amount of anti-suffrage sentiment and how they really worked to discredit the women involved in the suffrage movement. In this one here, we can see that this is a suffragette who is being presented as an absolutely a mad, wild woman who's been taken away by policemen. And what we also see in the anti-suffrage media is this idea that if women get the vote, it will turn things on its head and that it will change the world for, for the worse. There was a series of postcards called This is the House that Man Built, and they talked about the House of Commons and basically why women shouldn't be allowed inside the House of Commons. So we see uh, the production of pro-suffrage postcards in the same line as the This is the House that Man Built series. 
So we can see some of the positive versions of these here. You can see these are women as MPs inside the House of Commons, and it talks about how the House is absolutely right for women and they belong there. You can see the difference in the images. Uh, the the anti-suffrage postcard has this picture of an old, angry woman who looks quite violent and aggressive. And then the pro-suffrage postcards have these pictures of all these elegant ladies who are, you know, educated and respectable. And this was really what the movement tried to get out there, that these were educated ladies who deserved a place with the vote. And then you can see that this, uh, this moves into the newspapers as well. That, so we can see these are Dublin suffragettes and they're selling fruit and suffrage literature and they're playing a street organ. So this is a lovely scene. There's music playing, they're selling flowers and fruit and they're trying to win people over maybe in a, a less aggressive manner, they're talking to people. And this is very important because you're constantly thinking of how they're trying to counteract all of the bad publicity that has been seen in cartoons and newspapers. How do um, election campaigns um, compare um, between 1918 and those of today? Obviously, we have so many media outlets nowadays. You know, we have television, radio, uh, social media. We have a huge amount of ways in which to get that kind of message across and to win and influence people. One of the things I suppose that I would point out maybe that might be a comparative is that uh, we have, it's, at this time, we have suffragettes working with the Irish Women's Franchise League and they are in, involved in acts of militancy where they do things like they smash the windows of government buildings, they heckle politicians when they're out speaking and they also they carry out attacks on things like post boxes as, um, as a statement of their dissatisfaction of not getting the vote. So those kind of political acts, those kind of um, st publicity stunts to try and gain attention to the cause, those are things that are all still being done today. So the suffragettes are really you know, quite ahead of their time in the, the ways that they do that. So this was two years after 1916 and the rebellion and also the printing of the proclamation, a copy of which we have here in the Print Museum. And the first line on that is Irish men and Irish women. Did the proclamation serve the suffrage cause? To a certain extent, it certainly did. There is a line in the proclamation that speaks about equal suffrages for all its citizens, which is very important because it's the first time that it's really recognised that suffrage for men and women is equally as important. And it lays out really the grounds for the, the new Irish citizen. And that was something that suffrage has always pushed for. So Donna, from this amazing collection, do you have a favourite piece? There is one that would always have been quite a favourite with me, and it's this one here, which is an anti-suffrage illustration from um, a newspaper called the Leprechaun Month, Cartoon Monthly. So we have this picture here of this uh, little policeman who is walking a suffragette, um, possibly to the police station. And you can see she's a suffragette because she's holding a bag that says votes for women. And in that bag is a hammer. There's a lovely little sarcastic little poem with it and it says, Mary had a little bag and in it was a hammer. For Mary was a suffragette for votes she used to clamour. She broke a pane of glass one day like any naughty boy. A constable came along and now she's in Mount Joy. <laughs> so we have to admire the, the cleverness behind that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you for showing that to us. So finally, in 1918, the pressure paid off and the first general election that allowed women to vote took place in Ireland. Countess Markovitz became the first woman ever to be elected to the British Parliament. And then, in 1922, all women over the age of 21 achieved the right to vote in the newly formed Irish Free State. But did the hard-won right to vote change the place of women in Irish society? Was it the victory that it at first seemed to be? Women have got that once coveted right to vote, but they still have their inferior status, their lower pay for equal work, their exclusion from juries and certain branches of the civil service, their slum dwellings and crowded, cold and unsanitary schools for their children. Sandra, we have these really interesting pieces of uh, paper here, but they uh, tell us so much about uh, the history of um, that first election that was held after uh, World War I. Mm. And we can see uh, 
Countess de Markovitz's name on this piece of paper. Mm. Um, what is this? This is a notice of Constance Markovitch's candidature for St. Patrick's Ward um, in Dublin. So she, she stood for election. She was only one of two women who stood for election, um, herself and Winifred Carney. Um, and Constance Markovitch is the only woman who was elected in Ireland. And we know that she didn't uh, she take, didn't up take her seat. seat. Yeah. She didn't. She um, was elected. She was the very first woman to be elected to the British Parliament. But she was in jail in Holloway, actually, at the time when she was informed that she had been successful, that she'd been elected. And this is the notification that was sent to her by Dick Lloyd George. It's uh, addressed Sir, because that's the that's the only form of the letter they had. So it just shows you this was all, had been men beforehand. Men but she, only, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she she um, was sent this in Holloway jail. Why was Countess Markovitz in jail at this time? Well, she was re-arrested in 1918. So she'd been in jail in 1917, 16 and 17 after the rising, and she'd been released in 1917 under the general amnesty. But in 1918, a lot of revolutionaries were arrested again under the Defence of the Realm Act. So they were basically put back into prisons. Women, of course, uh, were only allowed uh, vote uh, if you were of a certain age mm, and yeah. had a certain amount of property. That's right, yeah. For, so men over 21 and women over 30 could vote for the first time. Um, and, and you had to fulfil certain other uh, criteria. So you had to be over 30, as I said, but you also had to have an income in property of over five pounds, which is, was really significant at the time. And what is this uh, letter here? This is notice? a very interesting notice because it is an example of support by suffragists for nationalists. Um, so this is a, a support notice from the Franchise League, which protests the imprisonment of Countess Markovitch. Uh, Kathleen Clark and Maud Gon McBride in Holloway Jail. So it would have been, it, it's, it's interesting because it refers to the women as themselves as, uh, as voters. So it's very clear that we are protesting this with the power behind us. We are voters and we protest the, the, the imprisonment of Irish women in an English jail. And of course, as we move down through the decades, uh, we know that uh, women really didn't have uh, the rights that they thought that they were going to get uh, when it was pronounced in the proclamation, when it was uh, uh, pronounced uh, after the election as well. Things well, weren't to change, really. They were promised it in the proclamation of 1916. It was, it was guaranteed in that. Um, but it, it became law in 1922, but only again because of the lobbying of women and, and um, some men. Uh, and they, they kept at it and basically got it enshrined in that 1922 Free State Constitution. Yeah. In many ways, the establishment of this Free State sees the end of what might have been a radical moment, a promise of full equality that was guaranteed in the 1916 proclamation. That does not come about. It became a, very, a, a democracy that was dominated by conservative ideologies and of course the power of the Catholic Church, which had control over education and healthcare, and that impacts adversely on women particularly. We see from the very beginning, the Common the Goyal government and then its successor, the Fianna Fáil governments, pass legislation that restrict women's position within the workforce, uh, women's ability to um, you know, access contraceptives, uh, the marriage bar is brought in, women can't sit on juries, um, all sorts of different types of, of legislation is passed. Now the women campaign against this and they try and resist this and they use the proclamation as a, a touchstone to say we were granted, we were guaranteed equality and now the discourse is all about domesticity for women and that dead hand of respectability, a respectable domestic woman was your quintessential Irish woman. And that then is reflected in the 1937 constitution and the woman in the home articles that we still have to this day in our constitution. People like Hannah Sheehy Skeffington kept campaigning through the 30s into the 40s because it, and some of the, the um, slogans that they used were, were things like women wake up can't you see that this has been taken from you 
it's amazing that these remarkable uh, women really gave their lives for mm. uh, the rights of, of, of women. Future in, women. Future women yeah. in Ireland. And then skipping forward mm. uh, to 100 years and uh, we still have these movements, such as the Me Too movement. Mm. And women are still looking for equalities on different mm. levels. Yeah. And it's just, it's incredible to think that inequality still exists mm. all over the world. It does. Yeah. Yeah, I think the important thing is to take inspiration from these women and just not give up. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. We still, though, have a gender pay gap, a gender pension gap. We have real issues around, um, you know, housing is a feminist issue, climate change is a feminist issue. All of those still need to be dealt with. And in many ways, when you re reflect back in 100 years, 100 years ago, we had a very radical feminist movement. We still have uh, the need for a radical feminist movement today. So in 100 years, a lot has been achieved. There's still a lot more work to do. I think that women today do encounter significant hurdles, but it's different to what the early suffragists uh, experienced because in their case, it was very often they would be breaking the law if they went into a certain space or they tried to run for election. Whereas now I think that a lot of the barriers that women um, face are implied and they're internal. The last 10 years have really seen a huge amount of new stories come out about women's place in history and the roles that Irish women played in our national history. And those roles and those stories had been very much hidden or forgotten about for many decades. And it's so important that they do come out now because I suppose speaking as a woman, it makes me feel that that is my part of history. That is something for me to be proud of and to recognise that women were not in the background. They were not on the sidelines. They were very much involved in the middle of hugely important national activity. Throughout this tour, we've seen how women have had to fight for equality in Ireland. And even now, in 2022, this is still ongoing. We are still discussing the fact that the Irish Constitution says that a woman's place is in the home. While there is still work to be done, it is also important that we remember the efforts and the sacrifices of those who have come before us to get us to where we are today. The activists um, of the early 20th century are an inspiration for me and they can be an inspiration for young people today because if they could overcome the obstacles that they overcame and overturn legislation and change people's mindsets, young people today can do the same thing. We hope you've enjoyed this virtual tour of bonnets, bandoliers and ballot papers. Here at the National Museum, it is our job to preserve and present the past to you. History is constantly evolving with new stories emerging all the time. So why not come visit us at one of our four sites? We hope to see you soon.